Thank you for joining us for the fourth session of our lecture series, Historic House Museums Respond to Crisis. I am Sheridan Small, the Director of Education here at Dumbarton House. Dumbarton House is a historic house museum located in Washington, D.C., and we're the headquarters of the National Society of the Colonial Dames of America. We share stories about life in D.C. in the early 1800s to the life of Joseph Nurse, the first register of the Treasury, and other individuals who lived and worked at Dumbarton House, both free and enslaved, as well as presenting lectures, exhibits, and other programs about historic preservation. This is the fourth lecture in a six-part series funded by the National Trust for Historic Preservation. I highly encourage you to sign up for the other sessions if you have not done so already and invite others as we will be exploring new topics and institutions each week as we learn how historic house museums have been responding in the past year or so to the urgent needs created by climate change, the COVID-19 pandemic, and social justice movements. Each session will be recorded and available on our YouTube page. So our previous three sessions are already up there. But by being here today during the live presentation, you will all get to ask your questions for, to our speakers. So kudos to you. As we talked about uh, during our last session two weeks ago, many, and I can probably say most, traditional historic sites have focused on the history of wealthy white landowners to the exclusion of other people who have lived on or interacted with those sites. For too long, historic preservation has privileged white spaces and white stories. This has been changing in recent years, thanks to the work of various institutions, as well as groups like the National Trust for Historic Preservation, which Catherine Malone France discussed a few sessions ago, it's recorded on our YouTube. These efforts accelerated with the calls for social justice in the wake of the murder of George Floyd in 2020, and many in the preservation community began to confront issues of race and equity for the first time. While at the Dykeman Farmhouse Museum in New York City, they have spent the last few years focusing on expanding their narrative. Through a grant from the New York Community Trust, the organization has been able to rethink the story that it shares with the community, both inside and outside the museum. Today, the museum focuses on site-specific art installations and educational public programming that highlight the experience and lives of people who were enslaved by the Dykeman family and brings the community into the discussion of advocating for an inclusive history. While the pandemic has limited our lives in many ways, it has also expanded possibilities for educators in the virtual space. Meredith Horsford and Richard Tomzak are here today to talk about some of those programs and initiatives, including the Dykeman Farmhouse's Grace Lecture Series. Meredith Soren Horsford has served as the Executive Director of the Dykeman Farmhouse Museum since 2015, where she leads her team toward creative and inclusive programming and interpretation with a community-focused perspective. In 2019, she spearheaded an extensive research project on the enslaved and free Black men and women who were instrumental in the prosperity of the Dykeman Farm. Her goal at the museum is to connect the past with the present through programs such as a recurring race lecture series, contemporary art installations highlighting the Black experience in America, and urban agricultural programs. Horsford has worked as a museum and nonprofit professional for 16 years, working previously as the executive director of the Gracie Mansion Conservancy, the official mayoral residence, and prior to that, deputy director of the Historic House Trust of New York City. She holds a Master of Arts in Geography from the University of Delaware, a Bachelor of Arts in Geography from the State University of New York College at Geniso, and a Certificate in Grant Making and Foundations from New York University. Horsford has also served as the president of the board of directors for the Greater Hudson Heritage Network. Richard Tomzak is research assistant on Dykeman Discovered, Generations of Slavery in Inwood. He received his PhD in history from Stony Brook University. Richard has several peer reviewed publications, including an article on Corvée labor in the American Revolution, published by the Journal of Colonial History and Colonialism, published by Johns Hopkins University Press. From 2017 to 2018, Richard served as a Fulbright Research Fellow, conducting research for his dissertation in Canada. His research examines the entangled relationships among law, labor, and empire in the colonial Americas. Thank you both for being with us today, Meredith and Richard. 
And let me stop sharing my screen so you can start sharing yours, Meredith. Great, thank you. Let me just get this up on the screen. Okay, can you see that, Sheridan? Yes, I can see okay. that. Great, I will get started. Hi, everyone. Um, as Sheridan mentioned, my name is Meredith Horsford. I'm the executive director of the Dykeman Farmhouse Museum, and we are located in Upper Manhattan. Thanks so much for joining us today. Um, also, you already heard, I'm joined by my colleague, Richard Tomzak, who will be talking a little bit later um, about kind of our collaborations and his teachings. I wanted to just give you a brief um, background first to kind of help explain how we got to the programs that I'm going to talk about today. Um, here's a brief timeline of the history of the site of the Dykeman Farmhouse Museum. Um, it was built in 1784 by the Dykeman family, um, or they paid for it, um, in what is now Upper Manhattan, um, but was then very rural farmland. It's hard to really imagine um, any part of New York City as rural, but at the time, um, the, the location where we are, which is the neighborhood of Inwood in Upper Manhattan, was quite far from what was then New York City, so it was very rural farmland. Um, at its peak, the Dykemans owned approximately 250 acres of farmland, which essentially encompasses present day, our entire neighborhood. Um, and this neighborhood, surprisingly enough, in New York City was not developed until the 1920s and 30s. Um, just a few historic images of the farmhouse, just to kind of give you um, an idea of kind of how it evolved over time and how the community kind of started to grow up around it, how, how New York City started to grow up around it. Um, in addition to Dykeman family objects, our collection also includes objects found by amateur archaeologist Reginald Pelham Bolton, who did excavations across northern Manhattan um, prior to the opening of the museum in 1916. Um, many of the objects date to the Revolutionary War, as well as artifacts from indigenous people and Inwood family farms. Today, we are located in a very busy neighborhood um, that is divided by Broadway. Um, we are physically on Broadway. Um, east of Broadway, which is basically just across the street from us, is traditionally where the Spanish speaking community lives. And west of Broadway is traditionally where the families that predominantly speak English live and what some in the community call the gentrifiers. The city has really grown up around this farmhouse and the half acre park that remains of what was vast farmland. The museum engages with the community through partnerships with local businesses and nonprofit organizations to run programs at the farm and throughout the community of Inwood. There are a variety of events that take place, including our summer STEAM camp for kids, history lectures, live music, specialized tours, bilingual story time, and more. Our community is approximately 70% Spanish speaking, with the largest group being people that moved here from the Dominican Republic. When I arrived at the museum in 2015, I very quickly realized that there was really no relationship between the museum and the community. I would have meetings with people and people would say, oh, that's a museum, I just thought somebody lived there. So that told me very quickly that we had a communication um, issue and maybe some other things as well. Um, so today we use community engagement and public programming to connect with our predominantly Dominican neighborhood community members of African descent, and all local residents and tourists. One of the first steps that we took um, at the museum to connect with the community was breaking down barriers. Physical barriers that blocked visitors from entering rooms were taken down, while the cultural barrier of language was eliminated through bilingual signs, uh, room labels, and communication with the community. The development of also, of also adding bilingual programming um, cultivated a new relationship with the neighborhood to connect the historical narrative of the museum with today's present day community. And it does not want to advance, let's see. There we go, oh, now it went too far. Um, these are just some images, clearly pre-COVID images um, of some of our programs and events that have taken place over the years. very slow with the advancing. Let's see here. Okay, 
Um, so when the pandemic first kind of closed down the entire country in March of last year, we as a staff and, a, and our board spent a lot of time thinking about how we could continue to serve our community's ever-changing needs and continue to serve our mission all while being closed to the public. So we developed a partnership with an organization called New York Common Pantry and Garden Kitchen Lab, which empowered 20 families in 2020 to grow food in their urban apartments in Upper Manhattan and the Bronx through our new Growing Uptown initiative as a start to closing the gap in food security, which we know was exacerbated by the pandemic in people's own homes. I missed that slide. To prepare for the launch of the program, museum staff developed grow kits with pots, soil, basil, parsley, and lettuce seedlings. New York Common Pantry distributed these kits on our behalf to their existing constituents. Kits were accompanied by bilingual written and digital instructions and recipes, which are also available on our website. These were all developed in-house and designed to teach families how to supplement their food needs through urban growing. We know that this pilot was a great success. 20 kits were distributed to families in need and several of our new urban farmers have kept in touch to share the progress of their windowsill crops. In 2020, we put together grow kits that were, I'm sorry, in 2021, we put together grow kits that were more robust and included food staples such as onions and tomatoes. We also greatly expanded our reach for this program, reaching 20 families in 2020 and over 100 families in 2021. Ultimately, these simple grow kits are helping families learn more about where their food comes from and are just the beginning of how growing uptown can foster successful, impactful urban gardening as we expand the program. Um, this program is another example of a community collaboration and the intersection of serving the museum's mission and serving a community need. Um, we've offered a free summer camp annually for the past six years at the museum always including a healthy lunch for our campers, as we know that food security is a large issue in our community. Last summer, um, obviously we weren't able to have our usual in-person um, camp because of the pandemic. So we partnered with a whole host of other local organizations in our community to offer a completely virtual camp that lasted for about a month um, and included all of these different organizations. So the focus was you know, it was really an uptown summer camp and you could learn about history, art, theater, and dance and all sorts of other disciplines. Um, so that was last summer and it was really successful. This year, we we're offering our own in-person camp, which is focusing on urban gardening, foodways, healthy cooking, and healthy movement. Um, it's actually going on this week as we speak. Um, and each child is actually getting a grow kit of their own to plant and bring home and share with their family. Another main focus in the last few years is our Dykeman Discovered Initiative. The Dykeman Discovered Initiative investigates the stories of the enslaved and free people that lived and worked on the Dykeman farm and the community that is now called Inwood. This initiative brings an inclusive history to the community, fosters a sense of transparency, and we hope engages visitors who have not yet seen themselves represented in the current narrative. We have found that the best way to connect with our community is finding common threads. So with a grant from the New York Community Trust, we hired a part-time research assistant, who you will hear from shortly, um, to uncover information about the people who were enslaved on the Dykeman Farm and other local farms nearby. With new information, we designed new educational materials for the museum, created public programs, and engaged local artists to produce site-specific art installations that communicate the story of underrepresented people. This project reinforces the importance of inclusive historical narratives in America's historical institutions of all sizes. Cultural and educational institutions across the nation are really beginning to implement underrepresented narratives in their curriculum and in their reinterpretation plans. No matter how big or small the institution is, these struggles are present. It can be challenging to discuss slavery, while being both receptive to the audience and maintaining boundaries for all groups and all backgrounds and age groups in a respectful manner. There are still many who are unfamiliar with the history of slavery in the North or have a perception that slavery in the North was somehow less harsh than it was in the South. Creating a narrative while also holding true to the life stories of enslaved people can be challenging as is a lack of collections that directly connect to this community. 
Though collections may be limited, we are finding creative ways to engage our community in conversations about enslaved stories. There are ways to incorporate the narrative of enslaved people over time or to take a much more direct approach. We have found it beneficial to observe and learn from peer museums in both the North and the South who have completed their reinterpretation process. We can use these examples to figure out what does and does not work at our particular site. We've made important steps toward expanding our narrative, but we are working to fundraise and think creatively about how we can continue to expand the stories that we tell. We also think that it is important to hold other institutions accountable to also progress in this manner. Our solution is to highlight these findings from our research process that dispels the inaccuracies of American history that hinders the African and indigenous narratives. The research findings that will be included in the reinterpretation of the museum leads to opportunities to bring these histories to the African and indigenous communities today. This one-sided history of wealthy white America has left incomplete and simplified histories. And we feel strongly that we need to highlight the importance of this research project and engage visitors in a conversation about it via public programming. This is particularly important for a community that, focus mar focus that faces marginalization on a daily basis. These communities have been secluded from our history for so long or put on display, oftentimes in institutions frequented by Western society looking to grasp at an understanding of people in the past. Instilling these narratives in public spaces opens an inclusive dialogue that can grow and lead to a pattern of inclusionary narratives throughout other institutions and in people's personal lives. As we continue our research, we're making discoveries about the lives of enslaved and free black people that lived in the Dyckman farmhouse, as well as on neighboring farms in the community. While much research is still being undertaken, Ricky and I will be sharing with you what we've learned about people's lives so far. H. Dorothea Romer's Jan Dykman and Descendants text tells of the location of a burial ground behind the previous farmhouse homestead. Quote, for years after Jacob's marriage, the two families lived in the Dykman house together. The burial ground lay immediately behind the house and in hallowed ground beyond were the graves of over 30 family slaves. Today, this is the location at PS 98's faculty parking lot, which is located on 212th Street between Broadway and 10th Avenue, just northeast of the farmhouse. The graves were dug up and destroyed during the process of urbanizing Upper Manhattan in the early 20th century. Reginald Pelham Bolton is quoted as saying, quote, the remains of these humble workers of the past reminds us of the time when even in this neighborhood, the practice of slavery was customary. Perhaps no other relic of the past could more decidedly mark the difference between the past and the present than the bones of these poor, unwilling immigrants whose labors cleared the primeval forest, cultivated the unturned sods, and prepared the way for the civilization that followed. We feel that it is integral to who we are as an organization to bring this information to the forefront and have conversations with our community about it. We do this through art installations and public programs. We participated in a press conference in August of 2018 with our then state Senator Marisol Alcantara to create a memorial at the Inwood African Burial Ground. Since then, we've continued the Dykeman Discovered Research Project and the partnerships that we have created through it. We are currently working with PS98 on a plaque, exhibition, and hopefully at some point curriculum development to make the students at the school aware of the sacred site. The Bowery Residence Committee, referred to here as BRC, provides housing and services for people experiencing homelessness in New York City. They may be purchasing land as a future site for a shelter, part of which was part of the Inwood African Burial Ground. After learning about the site's history, they stopped development activity and created Aegis, the advisory group for the Inwood Sacred Site, a committee which I chaired. Throughout late 2020 and early 2021, BRC held meetings with Aegis as well as public community conversations to learn about the community's thoughts on how this important history might be integrated into the shelters, into the shelter through architecture and programming. In 2019, we collaborated with local artist Peter Hoffmeister, who created a year-long site-specific art installation inspired by the unmarked African burial grounds in Upper Manhattan and in Hunts Point in the nearby Bronx. We continue to work with PS98 and with BRC to honor the African burial ground in, in Inwood 
which had been the site also of Lenape ceremonial pits. Unspoken Voices, honoring the legacy of Black America launched last fall as an exhibition centered on the Dykeman Discovered Initiative. In response to the revelations of the biographical information found on the people that the Dykemans enslaved, Unspoken Voices artists have debuted works that directly engage with the data, including the transformation of the family's leisurely front parlor into a space honoring the enslaved people. Sketches and clothing designs that mimic the daily life, fashion, and highlighting the humanity of those enslaved. And portraits depicting African Americans interacting with nature, inner spirit, and the struggle of forced labor in New York City. Let's see if it wants to go to the next slide. Just thinking about it. Now we went too far. Okay. Um, no Records was a pop-up project, pop-up public projection exhibition that addresses how we see and know history in the present day. Artist Reggie Black said, quote, the history of enslavement is deep in New York City, not just in the South as sometimes perceived. Every day we walk past buildings and streets named after slave owners. For us Black people to tell our own stories is a powerful confrontation of that history. Let's put that on display too. This was a really powerful project project that we were still able to accomplish in the heart of the pandemic. Um, this went up in December of 2020 um, and we were able to do that obviously because it was outside. Um, so over the course of two days, like I mentioned, this was a pop-up um, exhibition. Um, it, this project drew hundreds of local residents and passers-by who stopped and spoke to the artist and really engaged with this art. And it really got us, um, a lot of questions, some negative, some positive, mostly positive, um, on social media about this because I think it really um, drew people's attention. Moved by this important research that we've been working on and the murder of George Floyd, we created Talking About Race Matters, Join the Conversation, a virtual lecture series in which first began in August of 2020. We have featured professionals in the fields of history, anthropology, archeology, span Africana and Latinx studies, women and gender studies, music and dance, to talk about race all from different perspectives. We're hosting our third series beginning in the end of this month, and I hope that you will all join us. The theme is reestablishing sites, introducing an inclusive narrative to cultural and educational institutions. We believe that through this lecture, through this lecture series, we can create a stronger connection with our community and foster conversations that can move us forward. To raise awareness, we created a t-shirt that highlights the enslaved and free black people that worked and lived at the farmhouse. They are available on our website and proceeds support further research and educational programming on the topic of the enslaved and freed people highlighted on the shirt, who you will learn more about momentarily. And again, it doesn't want to go to the next slide. Whoops. Let me just go back a little bit here. Seems like it doesn't want to move. Okay. So we plan to create programming and art exhibitions that highlight the Black experience in New York City. We would also like to rethink our interpretation, starting perhaps with our winter kitchen, which is the space that um, I think the most, the largest number of kids and adults really kind of engage with. Um, we noticed really young kids making um, connections between the kitchen implements that are in our kitchen and kitchen implements that they've seen at their grandmother's house in the Dominican Republic. So it's really great to see such young kids make those connections. Um, so with a, our goal really is to tell a more comprehensive story um, of our community and for our community and really include them in that process. So now I would like to turn it, the presentation over to my colleague, Richard Tomczak. Thank you, Meredith. And thank you, Sheridan, for the opportunity to present on the, the, re the exciting research that we've been doing with the Dykeman Discovered Project. There we uh, go. So I'd like to start my portion of the presentation with two stories of two enslaved men that lived with and worked for the Dykeman family in two different generations. So first on, so I'm gonna, I wanted to tell the story of two different uh, individuals. On Tuesday, May 21st, 1765, 
an enslaved African-American named Will, escaped the estate of Jacob Dykeman in Kingsbridge, New York. Taking nothing but his clothes, described by Dykeman in a fugitive slave ad pictured here, uh, taking nothing but his clothes, described as a blue broadcloth coat and homespun trousers, a beaver hat half-worn with a hole through the rim, Will made his escape under the cover of darkness. Like many of the 10,000 enslaved people living in the province of New York, Will had been bought and sold multiple times, passing from the ownership of both the Alsop and Kettleus families in New York City before Jacob Dykeman purchased him and relocated him to his property in Kingsbridge. Will undoubtedly understood the perils of his decision to break his chains of bondage, especially under the cover of night. Just two decades earlier, the New York Common Council had ratified a slave code that made it illegal for any enslaved person to walk the streets of this city above an hour after sunset without a candle or lantern. The council further clarified that the sundown restriction could result in being whipped at the public whipping post. Despite the Dykeman's location north of city boundaries in the colonial period, Will's prior enslavement in New York City would have provided him with the insight that his flight would result in physical punishment and a symbolic demonstration of the law. Perhaps skirting the high road to New York through the forested hills of Manhattan Island, Will ventured south into city limits. One week later, a fugitive slave ad published in the New York Gazette specified that Will was last seen outside the Whitehall. From there, the document trail disappears and Will's fate is unknown. Uh, next slide, please, Meredith. Sixty-one years later, in July 1826, a free African-American man named Gilbert Horton languished in a jail cell in Washington, D.C., falsely accused as a runaway slave. District of Columbia magistrates informed him that if he did not provide evidence of his freedom as a native of Westchester County, they authorized his sale into slavery, sold as such to pay his jail fees. One month later, the news of his imprisonment reached his hometown in Peekskill, New York. Community leaders and the citizens of Westchester County in the Hudson Valley testified of his freedom. Gilbert had originally gained freedom at the age of eight or 10 years old from his owner, Stotts Dykeman, in exchange for his father, Peter Horton, working on the Dykeman property for a year. From there, Gilbert entered into the service of John Owen as an indentured servant before fulfilling his contract and navigating the tenuous laws of gradual emancipation in the Northern states. With the help of his father, Peter, abolitionist William Jay, and other Hudson Valley abolitionists, Gilbert narrowly evaded a second enslavement. Next slide, please, Meredith. As Meredith introduced, the Dykeman Discovered Initiative investigates such stories of enslaved people belonging to the Dykeman family and the community that is now called Inwood. This initiative brings an inclusive history to the community, fosters a sense of transparency, and engages with visitors who have not seen themselves represented in the current narrative. Each generation of enslaved individuals that labored for the Dykeman, for the Dykeman family faced unique challenges in their struggle for autonomy within this exploitive and often violent system of labor. Indeed, as historian Ira Berlin asserts, addressing these changes captures how generations of people of African descent wrestled with the realities of slavery and freedom, trying to fashion a world of their own in circumstances not of their own making. In short, the slaves bonded to the Dykeman family from the 17th to the 19th centuries, experienced vastly different laws as authority passed from the Dutch, British, and finally independent American government. Circling around a little bit to the topic of today's lecture about teaching the, the narratives and histories of slavery during the, the pandemic, a global pandemic and the hard work of archivists, museum professionals, public historians and folks in higher education have opened up new possibilities for students. As COVID-19 forced universities, museums and historic sites 
to expand their operations into a virtual space, we have many more recent resources available for classroom use. These new resources, including online collections and distribution platforms, helped me to engage with my students while I was working with the Dykeman Farmhouse Museum in ways that were previously unimaginable. In particular, the virtual efforts of the Dykeman Discovered Initiative helped me to frame the local impacts of slavery for my students, most of which learned of slavery in New York for the first time. <clears throat> this autumn, students in my Slavery and Freedom in the Atlantic World course had the optional opportunity to submit original artwork to a digital humanities project that was operated by Stony Brook's Paul W. Zucker Art Gallery. And wrote, they, so the students used primary documents that uh, they, that I, they had engaged with in class. A little bit more on that later on. In the spring, my Colonial American Society students also attended the Dykeman Farmhouse Museum's virtual lecture series, talking about race matters, to better understand the impact of institutional racism in their communities. All of this is to say that despite the restrictions placed on students and instructors this past year during the pandemic, Partnering with the Dykeman Farmhouse Museum and the Zucker Art Gallery provided my students with a creative outlet to historicize current crises and communicate their opinions about them in writing. For a little bit of context, uh, I had taught versions of these courses covering the colonial Atlantic world, the forced migration of 10 million enslaved people, and the racial hierarchies imposed on people of African descent around two times prior to the move to remote education. One of those times was delivered prior to the pandemic entirely online in a condensed three week winter session. Whether teaching online or face-to-face, -face, I expect my students to learn about the past, analyze primary sources, write essays, and develop critical thinking skills. The Dykeman Discovered Initiative worked hand in hand with the courses that I taught. I taught these courses while Meredith and I were piecing together the stories of enslaved people who labored for the Dykeman family. I encouraged my students to consider how colonists and planters crafted laws and institutions that subordinated enslaved individuals of African descent to the status of property. We examined the cultural traditions, uh, behaviors and rituals that spread these laws uh, and made them a fixture of the colonial environment, not just in the North or not just in the British colonies, but around the entire Atlantic world. Finally, we discussed the diverse labor regimes that revolved around both plantation-based and urban slavery and the important ways that enslaved people resisted the commodification of their labor. Our discussions connected these rigid hierarchies to contemporary issues like the pandemic, the Black Lives Matter movement, and the debates over who decides what histories are important. Uh, next slide, Meredith. So while many students on Long Island or in New York City, um, while many students learn of plantation-based slavery in their secondary education, most were surprised of the impact that slavery had in their communities. So pictured here, I know it's hard to geographically orient ourselves looking at Manh Manhattan Island from this perspective, but this is Manhattan Islands with the Hudson River to the north and the East River and the Harlem River to the south. I put a rectangle around where the Dykeman property was located. As Meredith had said, it was quite a large uh, section of land. Today it is Inwood. And then I've put an arrow to where the early 19th century urban city, the limits of that. So around where Central Park is today. Enslaved people on the Dykeman Estates of Kingsbridge and the Hudson Valley, not only traversed the legal restrictions that increasingly sought to commodify their labor, but also the landscape of Northern Manhattan. <clears throat> Located on a critical junction over the Harlem River, the Dykeman property connected their slaves to the commercial hub of the British and later American Northeast in New York City and the large Dutch American manors that employed hundreds of other enslaved people of African descent 
in the Hudson Valley. Uh, next slide, Meredith. So I actually want to pause for a second just to get a sense for the types of documents that Meredith and I worked with, but then that I was able to bring into the classroom uh, and really create this ecosystem, right? This virtual ecosystem where Meredith and I were working uh, on the virtual exhibitions and the pro public programming, bringing that into the classroom. So this table is just to get a sense of the different enslaved people that we have documentation for. Uh, the first document that we have associated with enslaved, an enslaved person residing on the property is Will, uh, with the 1765 Fugitive Slave Ad authored by Jacob Dykeman that I showed at the beginning of this presentation. Francis Cujo was born in 1769 and freed by Jacobus Dykeman in 1809. Harry, born in 1777 during the American Revolution, was also freed in 1809 by Garrett Dykeman. Hannah was born in the 1780s, and family histories attest to her living as a free person uh, by the 1820s. New York State slave laws in the early 19th century had yet to initiate gradual emancipation, so she would have been born enslaved on the property. And because of that, we also know that because Hannah was born on the property, it's likely that Hannah's mother will also work for the Dykeman family. Finally, the second story that I opened up with today, Gilbert Horton was born in the early 19th century before uh, he was freed by Stotts Dykeman around the age of eight or 10. Uh, next slide. Thanks, Meredith. So <clears throat> I wanna briefly go over some of, and show some of the, demonstrate some of the primary documents that we've been working with as we piece together the narratives of enslaved people that lived on the Dykeman property. So Hannah, we have family histories that attest to Hannah being born on the property and working as a cook into emancipation through the 1820s in New York State. Meredith, did you wanna share a little bit about the space down in the kitchen and then also um, the installation that you guys had? Sure. Um, so this is the space that I mentioned that we're thinking about um, as the first space that we really start to rethink our interpretation, the winter kitchen. Um, one thing that you'll notice in this bottom picture, um, obviously, is that there's something there that does not look historic, right? And so that's part of our art installation, the mannequin. Um, and so this is done by artist Gwendolyn Black. This is part of the Unspoken Voices um, honoring the legacy of Black America exhibition that is up now through the end of August. Um, and she really, this is only one of her pieces, but she really wanted to focus on kind of creating the garments for the enslaved people that she wanted to highlight in her show, um, but also really focusing on their facial features. And so this is all kind of hand painted, all of their facial features, really trying to highlight the humanity, you know, that not just it was more than just as anyone, right? It was more than one um, kind of note to each person. It's not just, oh, you're a person who's enslaved. There's more to it. They have family and, you know, tradition. And there are all sorts of things that um, are kind of lost when you just sort of talk about people as you know, somebody who is just enslaved. Um, so that was really her focus. And this is a space that, like I said, I think we could really um, focus on and, come up with some really engaging things that would really get people thinking about enslavement and living in this small house with the people who are enslaving you. Um, there are a lot of possibilities here. Thanks, Meredith. Sure. Uh, you can head to the next slide. So I think this is a good example of the synergy that worked between the work that Meredith and I were doing with Dykeman Discovered and pr using primary documents in the classroom, this virtual ecosystem, teaching online while working with the Dykeman Discovery Initiative. So documents like this, this is a manumission record for Francis Cujo. Uh, in some cases, uh, for building the narratives or the, the lives, um, reconstructing the lives of enslaved people that worked for the Dykeman family, we only have one such document, not authored by Francis Cujo himself, nor giving an account of his own personal feelings of his, his freedom or how he grappled with the complexity um, of, of this moment, 
However, we, do, we can piece together a little bit that Jacob S. Dykeman, uh, he freed Francis Cujo in 1809, and he did so probably under abolition. He utilizes abolitionist rhetoric that he was doing so uh, based on the consideration of motive of humanity uh, in giving kind of his motivation behind the manumission. Uh, next slide, please, Meredith. So a couple more primary documents that we've worked with. Uh, the names index for enslaved person was compiled by the John Jay School of Law in New York City. It's a database that we were able to utilize to get some personal information on enslaved people that worked for the Dykemans, including Harry, <clears throat> born during the American Revolution. We also have a newspaper, new, uh, two newspaper clippings. One is pictured here on Gilbert Horton's imprisonment when he was falsely accused as a runaway slave in Washington, D.C. And uh, some, of the, some of the quotes from folks in the Hudson Valley testifying to his freedom. And then finally, at the bottom right, uh, the fugitive slave ad from 1765 that Jacob Dykeman authored uh, on Will. Next slide, please, Meredith. My last primary document slide. So we also have probate records, state records for the Dykeman family. And so in an attempt to reconstruct some of the labor routines or the work that they were doing in, in each individual season, so fall for the harvest, um, the winter downtime, spring and the planting, summer and tending, the crops. We we're able to use the materials that enslaved people might have worked with in addition to the crops that they might have been planting, such as wheat and rye and corn. Okay, uh, next slide, please, Meredith. So I want to bring it back full circle now and talk and end the, my portion of the presentation with how I applied this in the classroom for my students. So in the fall, I gave students the opportunity to submit to a digital humanities project that was already underway on Stony Brook's campus entitled Reckoning Student Mural that was spearheaded and led by the Paul W. Zucker Gallery, which is the major art gallery on Stony Brook's campus. The idea behind Student, rec uh, student Reckoning was to create a, di a digital database of artwork, or original artwork that students created in response to the last year of their lives, going through not only the pandemic, but the upheaval of moving everything to remote, the insecurity of that, uh, and then the events of the summer and the Black Lives Matter movement as an outlet for creative endeavors by the students. And there ended up being a faculty reckoning as well, a little bit later on. So students in my Slavery and Freedom course, as they're workshopping these documents, as they're learning about slavery in New York City, um, I gave them the opportunity to use that material, to connect it and submit to the digital mural that the Zucker Gallery uploaded to their, and it's uploaded to their website. So you can go and check that out um, after this presentation, it's still there. Uh, next slide, please, Meredith. <clears throat> I should also clarify real quick that it was not just my students, not just my class, that the Zucker Gallery did an excellent job with outreach for it. Um, was there one more slide before that, Meredith? Okay, perfect. The last thing I wanna talk about is that in the spring, I extended another optional opportunity for my students to attend one of the Dykeman Farmhouse Museum's virtual lectures in the Talking About Race Matters series. Over two months, presenters shared a diverse range of topics that grappled with the complicated histories of institutional and cultural racism in Inwood and New York City. In my co-presentation with Gretchen Soren, I shared the narratives of enslaved individuals that labored with, for the Dykeman family, much as I did today. Uh, the work routines that they participated in and how they interpreted changing definitions of slavery and freedom. Because the event was virtual, my students not only got to attend an informative series of lectures, but they also got to pair that information with what they were learning in their formal education. And I hope that it deepened their sense of the impact that slavery had on their local communities. I think I'm gonna leave my portion of, of it off there, Meredith, and turn it back over to you. 
Thank you. Um, I think that that, um, oops, there we go, kind of concludes the um, information that we wanted to cover, but of course we wanted to leave um, some time for some questions. So we're open to them. Great, thank you so much, Meredith and Richard, um, for your talk today. This was so fascinating and it's really exciting to see all the cool programs and research that's being done. So everyone, if you have questions, please put those in the chat. Um, we do have some time for them. So I look forward to seeing those. Um, we do have some questions about uh, various aspects of your talk. So our first question is um, a little bit specific, Richard, about your research materials. So you mentioned a few times family histories that you use to learn particularly about Hannah. Do you mean the Dykeman family's written sources or someone else? Yeah, there was, um, as a historic family and a found, one of the founding fa families that transitioned from New Amsterdam to British New York to um, independent New York, there are family histories that are written down. And Meredith, you might be able to speak, speak a little bit about, speak to that a little bit as well. And so within these narratives of the family, it referenced uh, Hannah in particular living on the property. And there was just that one excerpt that talks about her living as a free person, uh, as a cook in the, in the house, I believe. Uh, Meredith, do you, do you remember off the top of your head what source that was? I don't remember what the source is off the top of my head, no. It's a, it's a narrative. I, it's a, a narrative of the Dykeman family. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, and related to that, were there any like surprising discoveries, maybe like a type of source you weren't expecting or a fact that got you really excited? Um, anything like that in your research? Yeah, I guess, I guess it's all so exciting that it's hard. To <laughs> For sure. Whenever we find out anything that we didn't know before, it's so thrilling. I understand. <laughs> yeah. So I think that one thing I want to highlight and that Meredith also alluded to about that kitchen area down there, down in the basement area of the house today, is that I think that one thing that we were really drawn to as we were uncovering this stuff was the multi-sensory possibilities so in, within the fugitive slave ads, the, the clothing that Will would have worn and the color, and we could really kind of identify what the material culture of slavery in upper Manhattan looked like. But we we're also thinking about going, because we have the estate records and the different materials and instruments that enslaved people would have been using, we can actually create recreate soundscapes and have them play as people walk into that downstairs area using period correct tools to recreate what it would have sounded like for enslaved people of the property. Wow, that's really cool. It sounds like um, the modern art installations, by modern I mean created in the present day, not historical, um, it sounds like these art installations have been so instrumental to having these conversations. Uh, we've had a couple of comments in the chat about you know, the challenges of talking about this history without objects and how all of the discoveries made during research can be incorporated into in-person tours or how special programming is then incorporated into tours such as the Reggie Black um, projection. So it sounds like you guys are doing a lot of art installations in the period rooms in addition to special programming. Is that right? Yes. And we found that, you know, by having these art installations up, I think that it is, it creates a really comfortable entry point to have a conversation with visitors about slavery where it's not like we're hitting anybody over the with the, over the head with the information that it actually kind of creates questions and then that those questions turn into conversations that are really I think probably much more comfortable than if people were coming in and receiving the information in a different way. Absolutely. And I think it gives a different atmosphere to the rooms, right? People are used to historic house museums being yeah. the same, never changing. And so this installation is like, okay, we've done something different in this room. So you're also welcome to do something different in this room. Exactly. And so, that so, immediately draws people's eyes like, okay, this looks different than all of these historic objects. And so that immediately starts a conversation, starts questions which is great. Awesome. Absolutely. 
Um, did you receive any pushback as you guys tried to expand the narrative and do these interventions in the period rooms um, from anyone, leadership, the community? Uh, and if so, how did you deal with that? Um, we haven't really received any pushback on doing um, contemporary art installations. We're in you know, the last affordable neighborhood in Manhattan. And so there are a ton of artists in our community. So we see it as a fantastic um, kind of partnership and a makes complete sense. Um, at least it does to me. Um, <laughs> and so we haven't really received pushback on that. I mean, we do have a very active um, social media presence. And so there are definitely occasional questions and comments about, you know, the Reggie Black um, installation, for example, which was obviously very visible and only from outside, um, you know, that people will ask questions or make comments that we always are very quick to answer slash respond to um, just to kind of keep an open dialogue with the community. So um, nothing really negative about the installations other than, you know, um, there were a couple of people who kind of said, well, why does it say slaves lived here instead of, you know, enslaved individuals mm -hmm. were housed in this house? And I said, well, first of all, the house isn't big enough to project that on. Second of all, it's an art installation created by an artist and I'm not going to tell him just as he wouldn't tell me how to talk about my ancestral history. It's not appropriate. So, um, you know, but again, we're always having dialogue with the community about, about this and everything else. No, it sounds great. That leads me to two different questions. One is about the community and how you're working with them. But the first one is about funding. So you mentioned um, the New York Community Trust funding, but um, have you had other funding for the art installations outside of, you know, Dykeman Discovered or for the free summer camp, for instance? Sure. So, um, you know, we're a small nonprofit. And so our funding is, you know, we're always trying to figure out new fundraising streams, just as I'm sure everyone else is. Um, so for the art installations, we've worked really closely um, with the Upper Manhattan Empowerment Zone. They have an arts initiative um, that they have funded us for several years in a row, which really is um, all about kind of exposing the public to art making. So they have funded not only um, some of the art installations, but also workshops. We always make sure that we have a workshop with the artists as well. So um, that's been a great um, support for that program. Um, for the, and then for things like the lecture series, we had our first lecture series was sponsored by, um, TD Bank. We have a great relationship with our local branch and they were really supportive of that. Um, we are also, um, the second, the series that's happening this month is being sponsored by BRC, the organization that is potentially going to be, um, building a shelter in the community. We've developed a great relationship with them throughout the course of their, um, project that we've been really um, really highly part of. So um, we've gotten sponsorships for the lecture series. The summer camp is pretty challenging to receive funding for, to be honest. Um, we've had small grants from kind of like um, Columbia Medical Center's uh, neighborhood fund, but um, and in years past we've had funding, um, but we've had a hard time finding actual full funding to cover, to cover this. And I, I don't know if that's because, you know, we're only able to serve a small number of kids um, or if they're seeing a million and one proposals about summer camps and they're just kind of, you know, like, okay, I, I can't do, you know, we can't find them all. Um, but that's something that we're always, always working on. And we're also yeah. currently trying to fundraise for this, you know, trying to think about our um, interpretation and what that might include. Absolutely. Yeah. Funding for one project might, you know, support another. And it's great to hear how much of your funding comes from your local community. Yeah. Uh, you know, so often I think we think of um, IMLS or NEH, these big, you know, national organizations and um, being so rooted in the community is really unique and really valuable, I think. Um, so that leads me to my other question, which is about community involvement. Um, it's clear that your community is very supportive of the museum and really involved in like workshops, the discussion groups. Do you also have members of the community in like an advisory capacities, leadership or decision-making capacities as well? We have several board members who are members of the community, local business owners, 
local residents. Yes. Awesome. That's definitely, I think, unusual for museums. Museum model is not. Yeah, that. we really felt like it was important for our board to look like the people that we're serving and to know our community, not just, you know, we, we don't have, you know, the board members who are just like the big donors who are just writing us these fat checks. We have board members who are really committed to what we're doing and really committed to our community. That's great. We did have one specific question about the lecture series. Um, I think maybe the talking about race matters one, mm -hmm. um, where someone has asked if there are any Dominican scholars or historians participating in that series. Um, we haven't had anyone who's specifically a Dominican scholar, but we've definitely had um, scholars of Lat Latinx studies who have spoken and participated in the series. Uh, and then I have another question kind of about community involvement. You had mentioned that when you first started in 2015, that there was little to no involvement with the community and a lot of um, missed opportunities maybe for communication and connection. How did you start to build up those connections and kind of establish that trust and welcome from kind of ground zero? Well, one of the things that I kind of mentioned a little bit was really thinking about what people see when they come to the property. If you noticed in some of those kind of present day pictures, um, when the museum was built, it was originally kind of right at street level. But once the neighborhood was created in the early 1900s, they really dredged down about 15 feet to try and make a, a more flat um, surface for horses to traverse because Upper Manhattan is extremely hilly. So we're now up physically very high from the street and it looked like we were just like a private residence, even though who has a private residence and a half an acre like that in Upper Manhattan. Um, and so it, it's kind, it was a little bit of a challenge to figure out how we could make it feel inviting when we're physically up very high. So, you know, we started to do things like make sure all of our signage was in English and in Spanish and all of our communication and um, throughout, you know, when we hang up flyers throughout the neighborhood or we um, do post things on social media, um, we started hosting programs that were also bilingual. That was helpful. We got rid of the room barriers and making it really feel more welcome. We got a new lighting system, which made, you know, it was really dark before that. So those were some of the things that we started to do from a physical standpoint. But also I just started reaching out to all of the organizations in our community um, that I noticed we're doing really great programming. So we developed a great relationship with the New York uh, Public Library. There's a branch, you know, just down the street. We started reaching out and establishing relationships with schools. Um, we started reaching out and, you know, to these liter link, um, which is a literacy program for kids that's bilingual. Um, and really just thinking through who's, who's doing good in the community and how can we partner with them, not, not copy what they're doing, but maybe there's an opportunity that our um, efforts kind of overlap and we can kind of um, have a wider reach that way. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that partnerships are one of those things that museums are trying to do more and more as they realize maybe their site doesn't have the, maybe the resources to talk about something, but they want to talk about it, particularly connecting the past to the present. And there are so many local community resources programs who are actively doing that work so why reinvent the wheel like partner and share those resources right and we That's also have great. partnerships that are not with cultural organizations like one of my board members is the founder of dipe and beer um <laughs> he's from the dominican republic and he's made his you know he's created his own craft beer that has the kind of flavors of the dominican republic and it's really popular in our neighborhood so we work with him for some of our events so you know we have some partnerships that may seem a little unlikely for a historic house museum, but um, I think that that also helps to bring in a younger demographic. Absolutely. It's so important for saying relevant, which is a word that we talk about so much and a lot of people aren't really sure what they mean by it, but basically we all want to continue our work into the future and people are only going to be interested if we meet them where they are and you know, find these connections to these interests. And so that's kind of what relevancy means to me, I think. But yeah. thank you so much, uh, Meredith and Richard. Um, that brings us to the end of our hour, but I really appreciate your sharing uh, your experiences and your projects with us. We've got some comments in the chat as well, people congratulating you on your successes. So it's just really inspiring to see all of this. And I hope everyone will join us in two weeks. Um, we're going to have a presentation on Vizcaya Museum and Gardens 
in Florida from Remco Jensonius about how they are tackling climate change. So a bit of a topic shift there, but we'll be talking again about some social justice and interpretation initiatives for our last uh, lecture in four weeks uh, when we um, look at another national trust for historic preservation site. So um, please uh, tune in for those and you can see all the recordings on YouTube. And thank you again so much for joining us live today. I hope you enjoy the rest of your days. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.